Inside Florida Politics, powered by the USA Today Florida Network. Abortion and marijuana will be on the Florida ballot in 2024. Trump considers a pair of Floridians for his running mate. And Disney agrees to a settlement with DeSantis. Hello, I'm USA Today campaign reporter Zach Anderson. And those are some of the stories I'll be discussing this week with Gannett State Capitol reporter John Kennedy and Palm Beach Post politics editor Antonio Fins. But first... Gentlemen, uh, welcome to April. Uh, we're getting towards the end of spring here. Did you bring some numbers for us this month? Zach, I did uh, come carting in a number this week. Uh, April Fools is behind us, but I've got a 1-1. One, one. It's an 11. And uh, and for you Spinal Tap fans, it's not inspired by Nigel Tufnell. <laughs> no fooling with John with an 11. How about you, Antonio? Like Billy Joel, I go to extremes. 60 trillion last month, this week, a 1. Wow. All right. We're, uh, Antonio is going low today, and I, I guess, am the highest with a 70. Remember those numbers, folks. We'll let you know what they mean in Florida politics at the end of the show. Well, the 2024 election has been light on drama in Florida, with the state increasingly trending red and looking like it's out of play for Biden and the Democrats. But the election got a lot more interesting this week when the Florida Supreme Court approved two ballot measures that would legalize marijuana for recreational use and protect abortion rights. The course also allowed a law pushed by Governor Ron DeSantis that outlaws abortion after six weeks of pregnancy to take effect. John, these are all uh, big developments. Are they are they really changing the election landscape in, in Florida this year? Well, they're, they're certainly altering the way we were looking at election 2024 in Florida. Yeah, it was looking to be a sleeper and all of a sudden it's just uh, busy as heck. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, most of the narrative so far this election season has focused on just how bad Democrats are doing in Florida. And, uh, you know, with the party out registered now by almost 900,000 Republican voters and Biden widely seen as likely to put, you know, little effort into winning Florida because it was just such a, a mountain to climb. But now with these amendments front and center, uh, Biden's campaign manager, uh, Julie Chavez Rodriguez, uh, just told us that Florida is in play and uh, they plan to put in a strong effort here. Now, what's what's you know, your take on that, John? I mean, how much of that is a head fake to the Trump campaign? Uh, do you think that they're serious? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a little bit of both. I mean, you know, th there is some you know hope for the Democrats right now here in Florida, but I still tend to think there's a lot bigger and better battlegrounds for Biden to uh, face off with Trump. And uh, Florida is still going to be a, a long shot, you know, to try to win the state of Florida. It's a tough state, you know, under good circumstances, let alone the fact that the state is trending red, as you pointed out. Um, but the, you know, the abortion access measure, measure that's going to the ballot, now that really fits perfectly into a central theme of the Biden re-election campaign, then that, that a vote for him is effectively a vote for restoring abortion rights that were stripped away with the Supreme Court's Dobbs decision of two years ago. Uh, the, the Florida ballot proposal is probably going to bring more women voters, more younger voters to the polls. And these are sectors that clearly support Biden over Trump, but who so far their intensity and you know eagerness to vote has really been questioned. Um, then you have recreational marijuana on the ballot, too. That also will likely bring a younger demographic, most analysts seem to assume. And uh, President Trump uh, does not do well with, uh, you know, that cohort either, you know, young voters or women. Uh, but now, admittedly, you're going to get Republicans that are voting for both measures as well. Uh, you know, you, there's plenty of MAGA Republicans who probably want to see ma recreational marijuana approved. But um, but all told, it, it seems to be a winner for Biden right now. Uh, you know, I think everyone realizes that Florida is still going to be tough for any Democrat, whether it's Biden or uh, Debbie Mercosal Powell, the likely challenger to Republican U.S. Senator Rick Scott. But what these ballot measures do not only pull voters to the polls, they will also require Trump and Republicans to spend more money here and make appearances here. And, uh, you know, they can't take Florida and its 30 electoral states for granted now, presumably. Um, and when you start, you know, when you drag that money and those resources and time away from other more vigorous battlegrounds, you know, where Biden actually has a close to maybe a toss-up chance of beating Trump. Presidential races are really run on a huge mosaic of states. And if 
if Florida is a hot spot that needs tamping down by Republicans, well, that takes away from their efforts elsewhere. And uh, so, you know, really, these rulings expand the presidential map. And for Biden, that was a, a huge plus right now. And John, you, you mentioned money. Uh, it, it was a really a big question as to whether Democrats would spend any money here in Florida. Now, it seems like probably there will be some some money spent at least to get out the vote for these ballot initiatives, right? I mean, getting on the ballot is is a big step for these constitutional amendments, but it's really just the first step. Now they have to go out and convince people to vote for these things uh, and, and, and to try and bring people out to the polls to vote for them. The, some of these uh, ballot measures have pretty organized campaigns behind them. Um, do you think there'll be some money spent um, on get out the vote efforts on uh, advertising these things that, that uh, could be helpful to Democrats in the state? Yeah, yeah, no, I think they will. As you point out, yeah, both of these uh, ballot initiatives uh, got to the ballot after spending a lot of money. I mean, they, they were big ticket items. The, 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 the legal medical marijuana industry is one of the is the biggest financer of the recreational marijuana measure. And uh, the uh, uh, abortion rights measure also got huge funding and is going to probably get even more funding with national groups weighing in. It's interesting, though, too, that both of these measures, to a degree, the uh, the sponsors of them are are kind of trying to stay away from the partisan politics of it. They don't want to make it sound like that a, a vote for abortion rights is a vote for a Democrat, especially in a state like Florida, where there's a lot of Republicans. So um, it's kind of interesting. They're trying to uh, uh, walk a little bit of a knife's edge there when it comes to uh, uh, they don't want to be perceived as Democratic backed or Democratic helping because they're trying to uh, make it, you know, on their own, on the merits of both the uh, abortion access issue and recreational marijuana. And on the other side, the Republican Party is already gearing up to fight the abortion amendment in particular. So there's going to be some money spent um, on on that side as well. And, you know, DeSantis won by almost 20 points. So, um, you know, whether... Uh, the m- money spent on on turnout and uh, some of these things is is actually enough to close that gap is is a big question mark. And he's and he's weighing in against it as well, you know, right. quite openly. So uh, you know, yeah, he said he doesn't want the state to smell like marijuana, right? <laughs> yeah, that seems to be one of the driving issues for him. <laughs> <laughs> he's got a sensitive nose. Up next, two Floridians are on Trump's vice presidential shortlist. Well, not only will abortion and marijuana be on the 2024 ballot in Florida, a Florida politico could have his name next to Trump's as the former president's running mate. Senator Marco Rubio and Congressman Byron Donalds uh, both are reported to be on Trump's short list of possible running mates. Both have expressed interest in the job, but there are some constitutional complications, right, Antonio? Yeah, they are, but I I think there's a workaround. Uh, Basically, the constitutional implication is the 12th amendment that basically says that you know the the, on a ticket uh the two should not be at least one should not be an inhabitant of the same state as the other and Mm -hmm. the way that's been interpreted is that uh you can actually be on the ticket but then you can't you basically forfeit that state's electoral vote and if you look at that electoral vote map uh there's no path to victory for mr trump if uh, if he can't pocket florida's 30 electoral votes Now, the workaround is what happened in in 2000. That was the last time the 12th Amendment really came into play in the uh, George W. Bush, that would be number 43, and uh, who ran with Dick Cheney. At the time, both were residents of Texas, but Cheney, if you recall, had been a member of Congress representing Wyoming. He had lived in Wyoming, was from that area. So uh, he hastily reapplied for Wyoming residency ahead of the deadline and obviously qualified. And then there we go. We had history of the, the Bush-Cheney ticket that won in 2000, thanks to Florida's 537 votes here. And um, you know, and then we was reelected in 2004. So there is a workaround. And Trump, for example, could just re, you know, resubmit his residency and be, a, again, a resident of New York. That seems kind of touchy because of all the legal issues he's got in New York, everything from uh, the trial coming up uh, later this month on the hush money, the purported hush money payment to uh, Stormy Daniels, 
to then the also the E. Jean Carroll uh, civil defamation lawsuit. And don't forget the fact that uh, the, the state attorney general's lawsuit against him in that civil case uh, where he's had to put up a $175 million bond. So there are pretty hard feelings between uh, Donald Trump and the state of New York. Uh, another possibility could be New Jersey, where he has his Bedminster uh, golf club and resort and where he actually spends a good time of the summer. So he could legitimately apply for residency in New Jersey and basically clear out this issue. Right. But is he that enamored of Rubio or Donald's that he would actually want to change his his residency to have them on the ticket when there's a lot of other uh, potential running mates? Well, they are. They are. But you know what? I, I will say, you know, Donald's is somebody who has been a rising star in GOP politics. And, and you know, and actually he's one of the few MAGA, you know, you know, MAGA Republicans that has been willing to go, for example, on CNN and defend sure. the president and, and before, you know, a pretty you know, contentious uh, panel discussion. So he's kind of earned his stripes there. Rubio's kind of like the really interesting one because... Yeah, what's uh, your take on him? Because some people would say that he's not necessarily a great fit. I mean, he, uh, a lot of people still remember when he ran for president in 2016 and it was down to him and Trump and Cruz and, and Rubio was scathing in his criticism uh, of Trump and, and, and really um, went after him hard uh, at the end. And uh, obviously he's, you know, kind of made up and, and kind of gone um, more into the MAGA camp since then, as as most Republicans uh, have. Uh, but, you know, there it, it does seem like Rubio is still a little bit more aligned with certain establishment uh, figures, especially in the foreign policy side. Um, and uh, it, it is maybe surprising to some that, that he would be interested in being Trump's running mate. That's absolutely right. But I think he's also got ambition. We know he did run for president. So he yeah. does have that ambition. Look, there are various things here. First of all, as you mentioned, Rubio really comes out of the Ronald Reagan city on a hill, big tent, you know, optimistic morning America Republican Party. And he's never been, like you said, he's never been a great fit in the MAGA world. And in fact, when he tries, I've seen him a number of times. He speaks every so often at the Forum Club in West Palm Beach. And when he tries to do the MAGA line, it, it doesn't really come off great. You and I remember back in 2022, we were covering, you know, he was up for re-election and we went to rallies that he, we covered rallies where he appeared with DeSantis. In Miami, I was there when he appeared with Trump. And uh, it's very clear that people attending those rallies were really there, the Republicans who were there really to see DeSantis or Trump, not so much Rubio. So he's still seen with some suspicion. And, and that actually goes back to, when he went, ran for Senate and won the Senate in 2010, he ran as a Tea Party Republican, particularly hardline immigrant positions, then kind of did a flip flop. And the MAGA, well, the Tea Party MAGA segment of the GOP really never forgave him for that. Right. Now, the interesting thing here, and this is why I think he really is in play, is if you're looking at the, this year's primaries, you're looking at that Haley vote. That's kind of like the same crowd as the Rubio crowd. And in fact, remember in 2016, Haley endorsed Rubio. Sure. And he did pretty yeah, well in South point. Carolina. <laughs> yeah. right. So you're looking at even in Florida, Haley drew about 13% of the vote. She drew 43% in New Hampshire, although that's kind of a little bit fudgy because they allow independents and Democrats. So let's put aside New Hampshire. But she did get a quarter of the votes in Michigan. And that's a really important state. And I was on the call this week with Julie Chavez Rodriguez when they were talking about how Florida's in play. And what they have been really aiming at, when they say they're in play, what they're really talking about is going after those Haley voters. And if not, if not winning them over to cross the line, cross the aisle and vote for Biden, at least have them stay home or basically leave that the presidential line item on that ballot empty or pick somebody else, one of the other candidates. So if you, Rubio probably coalesces and gives you more of that big tent. And when you're looking at a really close election, as we, you know, a real, a much closer, obviously, than in 2020, uh, that, that's a real consideration. And that's why I do think, I mean, I think both of them are, are under consideration. I think Donald brings sure. a lot of firepower to that ticket. He's kind of the guy that would really have Trump's back. It's, you know, that's what really these VP candidates are. Somebody, right. you know, to be your pit bull, your attack dog. And Donald's would do that, and he would do it convincingly to the MAGA crowd. 
But Rubio would kind of be like the Pence of of this election cycle. He would quiet some of the concerns (laughs) of a certain segment of the party, even though he's not a lot like Pence in disposition. No, no, but but that's a good analogy because what Pence brought you was the opening to the evangelicals that have proven so important to Trump. And what Rubio brings you is those more establishment conservatives and moderates that you need to keep in the big tent to win a close election. Well, for what it's worth, uh, you know, I talked to a Republican who has uh, known Rubio for a long time, and this individual told me that uh, they think that Rubio really wants it, that based on, um, you know, this isn't based on inside information, but based on his public appearances, based on what he said, you know, uh, he's been asked about it and he's had the opportunity to say that he doesn't want it and and he hasn't uh, done that. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, he came out and endorsed Trump right before the uh, Iowa primary, which was... um, you know, uh, a, a significant endorsement, uh, you know, it undercut Haley, who had endorsed Rubio um, and, and undercut DeSantis, uh, who was, you know, Rubio's home state governor. Um, and this person that I talked to said that everything that Rubio has done in the last few months seems like he is interested in being uh, Trump's running mate. So, you know, this does seem to be a, a, a serious potential pairing here and we'll, we'll see how it plays out. Up next, the feud between Disney and DeSantis takes another twist. Well, the feud uh, between DeSantis and Disney took another twist when the two sides reached a settlement over control of the government agency that oversees Disney's properties in Central Florida. DeSantis also appointed a new person to lead the agency's board, who is seen as not quite as antagonistic towards Disney. John, this is being portrayed as a truce between the two sides. How do you view it? Well, it seems like a truce, although uh, DeSantis uh, did declare victory, uh, boasting how the company had backed away from the agreements it had made two years ago, uh, then in an effort to retain some influence over the district when it was being taken over by DeSantis appointees. But, you know, I think maybe larger, Disney seems ready to move past the whole parental rights fight, the the don't say gay measure that was approved in 2022. And That's, uh, you know, Disney opposed that measure uh, and uh, that ultimately triggered the governor's takeover of the company. And it it didn't seem to be a great fight for either of them. It obviously didn't help DeSantis. Uh, You know, it didn't really seem to do much for him in his presidential campaign. And for Disney, I mean, they need Florida. That's, you know, their business is uh, the theme park business is pretty central. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, it, you know, it kind of seems right now that Disney realizes that, you know, it, that it's in Florida to stay and that DeSantis will pass eventually. Mm-hmm. You know, I think the company has sort of taken the long view and the the Central Florida Tourism Oversight Board, which in simpler times was known as the Reedy Creek Improvement District. Now it has a new administrator in Stephanie Kapalousas, who's, uh, you know, she's served Florida governors, including DeSantis in a number of jobs. Uh, so I think it's it's kind of a page turning time at the Magic Kingdom. Uh, for DeSantis, maybe not so much since, you know, he, he's still kind of pounding his chest about how the, the settlement that, you know, was a victory. He said that it proved he was, quote, right on parents' rights, right on changing the local government, and right that all the covenants and development agreements made at the 11th hour are null and void. So, uh, you know, he, he kind of spiked the football over this. But, uh, you know, what really I think also is going on is Disney's got other issues And maybe this settlement was driven by internal business decisions as much as anything. You know, CEO Bob Iger this week had to fend off a challenge to his leadership by activist investors, particularly billionaire Nelson Peltz, who's pushing the company to make, uh, you know, a plan for leadership after Iger. And he's also blasting the company's efforts to make more diverse movies and, and shows. This guy is, uh, you know, Peltz is a, 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 a formidable rival. He's a former DeSantis donor as well. Um, you know, Peltz is somebody who has ridiculed the company's Marvel products that, you know, he said are too focused on gender and racial diversity. Uh, Peltz lives in Palm Beach. And, uh, you know, he defected from the DeSantis campaign last year when, like a lot of these, uh, you know, big billionaires uh, and hedge fund guys, they, they they spotted that the governor was a likely loser. But Peltz still shares a lot of the same anti-woke worldview as DeSantis. So I, th- I think Iger and Disney leadership thinks 
prolonging this two year fight with Florida, you know, that was rooted in don't say gay, which, uh, you know, th th remember the opposition uh, to don't yeah. say gay began under previous leadership of the company. And, and they've kind of, they've basically lost that fight. I mean, it's, it's, uh, the law has only expanded and it's expanded around the country. So it, it doesn't seem like there's much they can do to stop that anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think they're ready to kind of back off this fight and just, just let it be. Yeah. And they also, you mentioned the, this activist investor, they also have competition from uh, Universal that is opening a new theme park in Orlando, and they probably need to get their ducks in a row to make sure that they're competitive uh, going yeah. forward. Well, we'll move on to some numbers here. Uh, Antonio, you want to tell us about yours? Yeah, I have one, and that is the number of primary challengers that have stepped up so far, so far, to Republican uh, first-term incumbent Laura Lee out of Tampa. Now, Laura Lee is, uh, again, serving her first term and someone who has a, a record of public service. She had been the uh, director of the state division, the state, well, Secretary of, Florida Secretary of State and director of the state division of elections. It was under her tutelage. And she was in that capacity appointed by Governor DeSantis during his first term. And she was in that capacity during the 2020 pandemic elections that were run pretty well in Florida. Before that, she was a judge. Her husband, by the way, is Tom Lee, a former Senate president who actually, and then served as CFO uh, during the insurance crisis, of the late 2000s, and basically helped right the ship there and, and start depopulating citizens' property insurance. Uh, so the question is, well, wait a minute, you have somebody who is a you know, long-term Republican who has served well. So, you know, as far as we can tell, has been a has, has a good track record. Why would she have a primary opponent in, in August? Well, because Laurel Lee endorsed Ron DeSantis for the 2024 Republican presidential nomination, not Donald Trump. She's and the only that, one to do it. Only, only, only member one. of Congress from Florida to do it. The only one, and that is an act of disloyalty. And what we've said many times, the glue that holds MAGA together is the perception of loyalty. So now you've got uh, this gentleman, Brian Perez, out of, I believe, Newport Ritchie, who has thrown his hat in the ring. And he basically said, hey, Donald Trump went on Truth Social, called for a MAGA uh, you know, uh, opponent to run against Laura Lee. I'm a, he said, quote, unquote, I'm the number one MAGA person out there. That's what he told our colleague Gary White at the Lakeland Ledger. And now he's thrown his hat in the ring. Um, and and I'm, probably there will be others. So here we go. You got a, you know, Perez, a former Navy veteran, really has had never held public office, but he may well get Donald Trump's endorsement. And we've seen how that has gone in Florida. So th this could be a, another indication signal of how much sway the former president has in his home state for the moment. Uh, uh, but... Uh, very influential, obviously, and he is the kingmaker here. Yeah, and this is Exhibit A and how Donald Trump keeps his grip on the Republican Party by uh, challenging any of these Republicans who oppose him. Uh, in, and in and demanding party. demanding yeah. absolute loyalty. John, you want to tell us about your number? Yeah, Zach, my number is 11, and you know how I like to go into the Wayback Machine. Well, just as Florida is making news now as a state that will have abortion rights on the ballot this fall, an issue that you know may prove a vote driver that could help President Biden and maybe Democrats. Uh, Eleven, that's the number of states that back in November 2004 had another vote driver on the ballot. That was the ban on same-sex marriage. Remember that when that was a, an issue. Uh, you know, just as Democrats now are trying to promote abortion rights as a central issue in this this year's presidential race, Republicans 20 years ago. We're, we're seeking to get some you know, additional help at the polls by getting on the November ballots in 11 states measures that banned same-sex marriage. That was, this was a backlash against places like Massachusetts and Vermont, which had begun allowing same-sex unions. Um, Florida wasn't cutting edge that year, remarkably. It, it, it didn't approve its own same-sex marriage ban until 2008. But in 2004, that was a presidential election year, and Congress had been unable to pass a national ban, the George W. Bush White House began promoting these votes uh, in part as a way to, you know, kind of drive conservatives and, and help the president in November in his race against Democrat John Kerry. 
you know, remember the Bush family was always viewed somewhat skeptically by the Republican Party's hugely important evangelical wing. And the, the same-sex marriage bans were a way for him to appeal to this vital voting block for Republicans that otherwise, you know, just might not turn out as enthusiastically for him. Uh, you know, so, so th this sounds a little like what we're seeing now with the Biden White House's push for abortion rights measures, which seven states have already embraced and which Florida and a bunch of others may still put on the ballot, you know, for the fall. Um, I mean, Florida is, is definitely going on, but other states are still in the process, it seems like. Um, George W. Bush was seeking re-election that year, 2004, and he barely had squeaked into the White House, as Antonio pointed out earlier, on the strength of carrying Florida by 537 votes after a 36-day standoff in 2000. And of course, the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq were dividing voters too. In the end, all 11 ballot measures were approved, most of them in red states that Bush also won, probably by slightly bigger margins, thanks to conservative turnout. Bush won Ohio that year, which was especially crushing to, to carry. Of course, you know, the, the same-sex marriage bans all effectively disappeared with the U.S. Supreme Court's approval of same-sex marriages in 2015. But, um, you know, it's one of those, like, nothing new under the sun moments. So, you know, Republicans two decades ago, it was same-sex marriage ban. Uh, this year in Florida, at least, and for Biden and Democrats, it may be abortion rights that brings voters to the polls. That and, you know, maybe recreational marijuana, which also is going to be on that November ballot. Yeah, and it seems like it helped Republicans choose turnout this year. We'll see if uh, the, it does the same for uh, Democrats. Well, my number is 70, as in 70 percent of Florida voters currently support the constitutional amendments uh, protecting abortion rights. That's according to uh, an article by Mark Caputo in The Bulwark, who um, talked to Ryan Tyson, uh, a well-respected pollster in Florida uh, uh, who worked on uh, Governor Ron DeSantis' uh, presidential campaign, is known for producing accurate polls. Tyson said that uh, in his survey, about 70 percent of Floridians currently support um, the abortion rights constitutional amendment. That's um, uh, good news for uh, supporters of that amendment. That's a pretty strong position to be at uh, going in. You need to get 60 percent of the vote to uh, to be able to pass a constitutional amendment in Florida. However, as uh, John and I talked about earlier, uh, once this uh, these campaigns ramp up, um, the, the things could change. Governor DeSantis has come out against this. If he is campaigning against it, that could move the needle with Republicans. The Republican Party of Florida has come out against this. Um, and if they put some money behind it, that could move the needle. And the more partisan this becomes, the less likely uh, that it passes. Well, that wraps up another episode of Inside Florida Politics. I want to thank our production guru, Rob Landers. And thanks to all of you for listening. We're out of here. <laughs>